Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today and welcome to Cicada Innovations Monthly Buzz, the science of food from paddock to plate. Uh, we're hosting this in partnership with Avocac today. Now, today we'll be talking about the potential of biotechnology and how it's revolutionizing what we eat. Uh, and for centuries, we've been uh, selecting and harvesting seeds to produce foods. And as our population has swelled, so has the need to um, improve crops. And now we fast forward to the present day and uh, biotech is being used as a tool to not only improve uh, yields and, and, and produce, but to create entirely new foods. Uh, it can also help mitigate against the impact of climate change and um, help us achieve food security. The, the potential is limitless. You know, but along with these advances in technology, there are some challenges, you know, especially around the uh, around regulation and uh, public perception of these technologies, like with any new emerging technology. So to help us explore these opportunities and, and also these challenges, we're joined today by David Bucher, CEO of Change Foods, Michelle Colgrave, Future Protein Lead at CSIRO and Professor at ECU, Philip Ellery, Chief Scientific Officer at Sustenant, and Gordon Black, CEO at East West Capital. So thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Um, why don't we quick kick off with a, with a quick lightning round intro. Um, maybe just tell us who you are and a little bit about what you do, uh, and we can start with David. Great, thank you so much for, for having me here today. And it's a, it's a great event, I'm sure. Uh, my name is David Booker. I'm the founder and CEO of a new sort of food tech startup called Change Foods. Um, we started here in Australia, but we also have now a US parent company um, for some reasons that we can probably touch on later, but we're effectively recreating cheese and dairy products um, via sort of precision fermentation technology. My background is actually aerospace engineering, you know, for most of my career at Boeing here in uh, Melbourne, Australia, but made a transition to alternative proteins probably about five years ago when I um, personally changed my diet upon sort of learning and doing a lot of research into the effects of industrialized animal agriculture on in so many different domains, including climate change, human health, and nutrition, and of course, the ethical treatment of animals. And then with, um, I could see this, this technological revolution that was occurring in food, which was super exciting to me. And I felt it was a true contender as a, as a real solution to help accelerate mass social change quickly, which motivated me you know, to change my whole career and profession to support this technology. Um, so I also um, helped start a not-for-profit organization called Food Frontier here in Australia, which is an industry think tank and uh, accelerator for alternative proteins. And that learned me to lot to learn a lot about this space and all the technologies. And this is where I've landed a few years later on. So no, super happy to be here. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. And uh, how about you, Michelle? Yeah, hi, and thanks for having me too. Um, so um, my name is Michelle Colgrave. I'm a, um, an anal analytical scientist by training, um, but I'm now leading an initiative called the Future Protein Mission within CSIRO. Um, it's an initiative that is um, homed within CSIRO. Um, and I come from the agriculture and food uh, business unit there, um, but it's actually a, it's a really a coalition of the willing. It's a consortia approach where we bring together industry, um, government, and we also bring together all of the academic sector um, to solve some of the challenges that we face in terms of um, our future food production. And so we're really looking at a few areas. Um, one of those is around plant proteins, like you, you mentioned uh, previously about um, harvesting those seeds and, and how we can use biotechnology to advance that. Um, we're also looking at our traditional and valuable agribusinesses like livestock and aquaculture and how we can build on brand Australia um, in that space. And we're, we're also looking at the, the emerging industries like what David just mentioned around precision fermentation and um, other emerging industries like insects. So I'm very happy to be here today. So, so thanks for having me. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, maybe you, Phil, and then we'll finish up with Gordon. Sure. So Phil Ellery. Uh, so I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of an Australian agricultural biotech company, Sustenance. Um, scientist by trade and then have worked in and around the biotech sector for about 20 years, I guess. Um, mostly in medical uh, science, uh, mostly, but now in agriculture. Uh, so we're a company focused on using microbes to unlock the potential of green waste. So when I say that, I mean things like problematic crop and uh, food uh, processing byproducts. Uh, right, la right now, and to really simplify it, we're using mushrooms to turn crop waste into livestock feed. But there's really a whole range of valuable products that we can make through 
subtle tweaks to the process and broadening our collaborations with others across the, the value chain. So things like food, healthcare products, through to novel packaging, construction materials, it's, it's pretty endless. So um, after graduating from the Grey Lab Accelerator Program at Decatur in 2018, uh, we managed to raise some money. We just closed our round just as COVID hit. Um, so that was a pretty hairy process. Um, our most advanced project is with the New South Wales sugar industry. So we have a partnership with, uh, with Sunshine Sugar um, and we're in the process of constructing a scaled up pilot facility that will push through a couple of tonne a day of material as we move towards uh, constructing a, a solution with capacity to process the, the more than 100,000 tonnes of, of biomass material that's available to us. So great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Gordon? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Melissa, for um, uh, chairing today's session and everybody that's attending and anybody that's out there watching. Um, it's a very interesting area. We've all just hit the, what, the first month of, or finished the first month of the year, almost finished the second month. The amount of activity in this uh, whole sector that we're talking about is just amazing. But uh, in any event, seeing you asked to, to be introduced, um, I'm Gordon Black, CEO of East West Capital. I started off in the late 70s doing a biochem chem degree here at University of New South Wales. There were no jobs at all back in those days. And I went the finance capital markets route, which is pretty important for all the emerging companies around these technologies to raise money. So I guess that was good. Um, ended up doing an MBA in, uh, at Wharton in the US in Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania. Worked on Wall Street for a bit but went back to my first love, which was really life sciences industry and joined, lucky enough to join DuPont, which is now no longer with us. It merged with Dow recently and split into three, but still playing a very pivotal role in the life sciences industry globally. But I um, uh, joined them in a corporate planning role and, and mergers and acquisitions in Asia, which was kind of interesting being back here in Australia. Um, I set up East West Capital in 2005, really a um, bit of a brave move. There was just, very hard to raise capital any time in, in early stage technology, but particularly around um, biotechnology. There weren't too many winners except the human healthcare space, at least in Australia. Um, so ended up um, uh, you know, starting East West Capital. We're still around 15 years later, but it's been a, a great learning experience. We're now today a major investor in Bolt Threads, which we can touch upon, which is mm -hmm. David and um, uh, Phil's kind of involved in this as a feedstock play, but with David charging on down the uh, the alternative protein food um, route, which is on fire. Um, so is the textile materials side, biomaterials, where we're looking at using agricultural waste fermentation technology to make clothes, you know, textiles, you know, leather substitutes, all sorts of things. Anyway, I could go on. I've probably gone on for too long, so I'll, I'll keep oh. quiet, but... A very interesting sector, a lot to do. And as, as I said at the outset, it's really a, a lot going on despite the pandemic and a lot to get excited about. Well, look, I think that's, uh, I think a good place to start is probably, you know, we, we bandied the word around a lot for the first few minutes, but what, what is biotech? Um, you kind of already touched on some applications in the agri-food sector, Gordon, but maybe you can just spend a minute or two uh, expanding on that. What is biotech? You know, where did it, where did it start? Start getting used in ag, and then maybe Michelle, you can you can talk a little bit about yeah, from Sarah's perspective too. A really good starting point. It, you know, these definitions are important, but I don't think we should get too hung up about it. I, from an investing viewpoint, have a broad definition, um, but the one that's bandied around is a bit more narrow. And the narrow one's really around genetic engineering and molecular biology of cells, would be they human, animal, or um, increasingly microorganisms, yeast, fungal, bacterial cells, manipulating those. But I really look at it more as a, a knowledge of those cells and, the, and their organelles, how they actually work, and then figuring out, you know, what you could do commercially or industrially with that knowledge to to then bring it into place. So that's really the, uh, the definition I, I look at, at as an investor. Um, so what kind of things can you do, Michelle? Like, what are some of the applications that you know you've seen along the value chain, the food and ag value chain? 
Yeah, look, I'd probably even take a bit more of a historical perspective on biotech and go to one of my favourite topics, which is beer, um, and think about, you know, the, the introduction of beer over 6,000 years ago, um, where it's, it is literally brewing is the oldest biotechnological process known to mankind. And I think those sorts of technologies have now been deployed um, into cheese, and David will um, talk about uh, some of that. Um, but it's really, yeah, it's just that technology applied to biological systems. And I think some of the examples we've given here around uh, precision fermentation are really key because now we can we can engineer a yeast to produce any designer protein that we're interested in. So the example of bolt threads, you know, of Clara Foods and um, who are producing, you know, the egg proteins without the chicken, um, the perfect day who are producing milk without the cow. These are things that we would never have thought about. Um, so it's, it's some of those areas, but it's also about how we can engineer our, our crops and our um, other agricultural commodities to deliver, um, you know, safe foods, high protein foods, protein foods with um, greater protein quality um, that really meet some of the mark for, for the consumer who are looking for those health attributes, but also looking at really sustainable options. Fantastic. And look, I know, um, Bill and David, you kind of touched at a very high level on what you're doing. Maybe you can talk a little bit more like that so we can get an understanding of, all right, this is what biotech is. These are some of the applications. What's the opportunity for Australia, you know, and for startups here, why is it such an exciting space to be in? Do you want me to start? I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, I mean, what's really fascinating to me is like when you look at cheese or a product like cheese specifically, I mean, this type of technology in regards to sort of precision fermentation and sort of the use of microbes, um, you know, um, to, to derive sort of high value products or processing aids in food. I mean, goes back over 30 years in cheese, exactly, right? So 90% of cheese is made worldwide today, actually made by a non-animal rennet to coagulate the milk. And so non-animal rennet, you know, is actually derived from microbial um, biotechnology. So, you know, most consumers don't even know that, they're not familiar with that um, because no one's really shone a light on it. But now obviously because of the technological progress over, over the last, you know, two decades predominantly in regards to advances in molecular um, biology and analytical um, processing means that the costs of this type of precision fermentation technology is now starting, it's been exponentially decreasing actually year on year. On year. Um, and, and because of that, we're now seeing it start to be very competitive in food products, which is not why you're seeing now the growth and the emergence of, of this type of technology, rather than just being focused on sort of very high value um, products like non-animal rennet, which only you need a tiny amount of to for it to to process into into what the desired outcome. Whereas now you're starting to see it from more structural elements, like and which is why you're seeing the emergence of obviously proteins in food, and now obviously you know the formulate formulating them into things like cheese as, as finished end products, which is super exciting. And I think the opportunities are tremendous. You know, per capita protein consumption is only ever increasing. Australia plays a critical role in the supply and export of these proteins into Asia, where a lot of the demand is coming out of over the next 20 years in Africa actually and so that's where I think you know it's, it's a hugely prosperous and opp opportunity um, for Australia to get involved and for the emergence of many many more companies working on these type of uh, food products and beyond you know in terms of biomaterials and so forth I mean it's just tremendous. Yeah amazing and so Phil uh, you did touch on it lightly how are you guys using biotech to transform the industry here in Australia? What are some of the exciting things? Uh, maybe you can unpack a little bit what you were talking about uh, when you were introducing yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, you know, I guess as Australians, we, we consider ourselves an ag nation and, you know, it, it contributes $50 billion to the GDP um, in terms of base products, but it contributes fourfold that if you include value-added products. And I think that's where the real opportunity is for Australia to to really value add to what we produce. And I guess from a bias perspective, I don't think that we make the most out of what we grow. You know, we, we, we use very little of the crop. We only use the most perfect seeds, the perfect fruits, etc. So there's tens of millions of tons of biomass that's being grown and cared for um, that's underutilized. And it, it often ends up being problematic and, and difficult to get rid of. So it shouldn't be just about how we grow more, but how we extract more value from every part of the crop. Um, yeah, that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah. 
Cool, so that's really interesting because we're talking about it kind of at the other end of the value chain around consumer facing products, you know, around, you know, uh, on-farm uses of biotech. I actually also, I know we're jumping around a bit, but Gordon, you know, you mentioned that you were at DuPont. Um, you were kind of around when, you know, at the emergence of this, uh, of certain technologies, especially like gene editing. What was your experience of working for a big agribusiness in the biotech industry at that time? Well, twofold. One is that the organisation itself took this whole, uh, you know, modern technology, genetic modifications, and actually before that, it was um, just thinking about it, it was fluoro fluorocarbons. Remember our aerosols that we were spraying that were depleting the ozone uh, layers? So um, in their atmosphere, there was all sorts of um, uh, work done to try then, and this is like early 90s when I was working there in their head office, I remember even going to an AGM where Greenpeace was act active there at the meeting around the fluorocarbon issue um, and ozone layer depletion. It's taken incredibly serious, but it is a very serious issue. We've seen in this latest period, um, even with you know the rollout of the vaccine in this pandemic, post-pandemic period we're in, hopefully, um, about you know how difficult it is to get science scientific messages out. So you asked me about what it was like working in DuPont. They were a very, very safety conscious company and a big PR department to look at this, these issues of agrochemicals, genetic modifications of seeds, um, you know, all of these uh, chemicals. And so they took this really serious, but it's a full on job. And, you know, you need to be very transparent with the population writ large, consumers and, you know, be at it 24 seven. and you know, I think if you want to talk about risks of bringing early stage technology to market, you know, these are issues, um, you know, that we need to tackle going forward as, a, as an industry because they won't go away, unfortunately. So um, I'm not sure I've answered your question totally, but it's been around I, in my lifetime since the 90s, working in head office, as I said, with Greenpeace, GMs have been an issue. CRISPR technology, um, you know, if you, we come up with new products, there's a lot of money being raised to develop new fruit and vegetable varieties, crop varieties, and products generally. But in the in Europe, you, you know, you still have some issues around, you know, releasing those products. In the US, it's a different story. Um, but CRISPR has a, has a much better chance of, um, because of what it does and how it works in terms of um, getting a product to market with consumers, hopefully giving it a tick, you're still gonna have some issues. Well, maybe um, this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about public perception and biotech. You know, you guys are working at, at literally the bleeding edge of like new and, and, and incredibly cool technologies, but the pathway to market is not without its challenges and controversies, like, you know, with any emerging technology, like, uh, like Gordon said. But, you know, biotech in the agri-food industry, uh, for example, uh, like Jordan, uh, like uh, Gordon said, with genetically modified crops, has received a particularly large swell of opposition and dare I say alarmism. Um, you know, is it for good reason? You know, we hear about the risk to human health and and environmental biodiversity concerns for farmers and their sovereignty and antibiotic resistance, and you know, the list kind of goes on. It's a really big topic. So, you know, what are some of the real risks and challenges to bringing these technologies to market, especially if they are consumer facing? You know, can we maybe debunk some of the uh, some of the misconceptions? So this is what biotech is, and what isn't it now? Uh, does anyone want to have a crack? <laughs> I can I can start there. Um, so I think the important thing to understand now is that um, GM has been around for quite a, quite some time. Um, we've now established frameworks around um, what, what is required to get a product to market um, and understand a whole heap of the risks um, around that. So we look at environmental safety, we look at, um, we look at some of the uh, human-centric um, uh, activities. So for instance, we're looking at um, whether there's a risk of allergenicity or, um, or any uh, you know, toxicity overall. Um, so when we're, when we're looking at a genetically modified crop or um, any product, we will really um, have a really deep understanding, more so than we would actually have of, um, of a traditional crop that was produced by breeding. So we actually do a, a lot more research. There's years of research that goes into understanding the safety of those. Now, as Gordon mentioned, um, gene editing is a different technology that's used. 
And um, because of the fact that you don't have the sort of the propagation issues, then you're, you're at a point where it's, it is going to be more, um, I think, accepted. Um, and, you know, there's some really great examples out there of both gene edited and um, genetically modified um, technologies that have come through and are, and are making their way to market. So maybe I'll just give you a tangible example. There's a piece of work we did within CSIRO um, where we um, produced a canola variety that produces omega-3 oils. So omega-3 oils are typically um, generated or extracted from fish um, and they the fish actually eat, eat uh, plankton to get that source of oils and, and then they're bioaccumulated. Now this, um, this new variety of canola can actually produce as much in one hectare of canola as you can get from 10,000 kilos of fish. So that's a huge win in terms of environmental sustainability. So there's some really good reasons why we might take um, an approach like genetic modification to, um, to deliver something that is going to have a huge health benefit, especially for those people who don't have access to fresh fish, um, they're landlocked countries, and, and there's a, there's, you know, omega-3 is a, a, and it's a micronutrient that's missing in a lot of people's diets. So I think when we demonstrate the impact we can have, that really goes to um, deliver um, that, that acceptance in the consumer, um, in the consumer's, consumer space, and also the amount of work we do in terms of um, the regulatory acceptance will really enable the next technologies to come to market. Yeah, well, I mean, Gordon, you were telling me um, at one point, one of the buildings you were working in was actually, yeah, stormed by Greenpeace at the time. So I remember, you know, I've read a lot of books around the anti-GMO movement. Um, it feels like there was a, yeah, I don't know if we want to say there was a lot of misinformation out there or if it was just alarmism, but I definitely feel like we've, we've come a long way. Um, so David, what do you think? I mean, you know, you are, I know you guys have lot of, done a lot of work in your brand. You've just hired an amazing uh, CMO, Irina, who is an excellent science communicator. Um, how are you guys uh, managing kind of the perception? Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, we brought in a CMO like Arena, Gary, from Danone so early on in our journey because I could see that the consumers, you know, there's an education that needs to occur. And GM is a very sensitive and interesting topic because it's such a broad spectrum that people have certain perceptions about. And really, when you start thinking about something like the products we're developing, I mean, we use GM as part of the processing as once again, in 90% of cheeses, they're using that same technology. But really, the, we filter away, I guess, the proteins themselves and leave the sort of DNA and sort of the supernatant or the, the fermentation broth and so forth. So but really, like that's too techy for people to sort of grasp and understand, right? And so it's, G, it's not a GM product, but it's GM derived. And so the subtleties there that consumers need to be sort of understanding of um, but more so than that keeping out the discussion out of the lab it's around perception and perception is reality for consumers and so how do you what's the language you frame around this how do you discuss this and make it appetizing and not an experiment people don't want to eat an algorithm they want to eat food <laughs> that's delicious and tasty and so you know we see this as an enabler of technology to provide the same foods that people love but without the same process to derive it you know you can't innovate a cow unfortunately you know so we've got to turn to other innovations and technologies to still meet the demands and provide people and uh, products to people that they can still enjoy but with obviously a fraction of of the impact so i guess um public perception is just one kind of i don't want to say it's an hurdle let's call it an opportunity um, so what about some of the other roadblocks faced by, you know, a biotech startup or a biotech company? You know, we know at a high level there are, you know, I mean, Gordon, in 2005, when you started your, 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 your fund, there's obviously a lot more money out there, but we do know access to capital and challenges around, you know, um, scaling infrastructure and, and regulatory hurdles. There seem to be a few roadblocks that are specific to biotech companies. Um, Maybe, Phil, can you speak a little bit about what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced, if any? I'm sure there are some. <laughs> oh, it seems like Bill. Yeah, has... absolutely. I mean, we face the same challenge. Oh, sorry, my internet connection is going to fail me. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. So, yeah, I think that we face many of the same challenges as, as any other startup. You know, money, time, momentum, motivation in the face of, you know, everything against you. Um, but then you've got the added complexity of, of biology. Um, 
you know, our sprint cycles are, are not as rapid as building an app. Um, you know, we, we as scientists, you know, we, we tend to want to understand every single bit of, of what's going on in the lab, but we need to focus on what will have the greatest commercial impact um, and, and just sort of put that, that sort of mentality of, of understanding every bit of detail until we've got a bigger war chest and more time and more funds to explore those things. Um, but really, I guess the, the really the biggest challenge that we're looking at right at the moment is transitioning from lab to field um, to get to that sort of scale where you can really make an impact. Um, so as I mentioned before, our, our collaboration with the New South Wales sugar industry is a it's a hundred thousand pound problem. Um, so you know you, you identify a whole heap of new challenges. It's not just about biotechnology at that point in time. It's an unco uncontrolled environment. Um, but certainly our approach has been to, to take our technology from the lab into the, into the field as quickly as we possibly can. And are there any challenges that are specific to uh, Australian startups in the biotech space, do you think? Um, we had a, a question come through uh, during event registration. Someone asked, um, you know, would maybe startups or that were based in San Francisco or in other countries have a huge late start advantage? What do you guys think about that? So I might jump in to begin with, um, and I think that there's there's a couple of things to unpack in that question. Um, you know, so Australia has a, has a limited population compared to some other jurisdictions, and so of course the investment and the you know the size of the domestic market um, are you know not as as large. Um, so we've got. Um, we've got some of those challenges around, okay, well, if we do scale something, um, we're actually maybe having to look at the export markets um, around how do, how do we deliver that scale of product to those markets because the domestic market may not provide the demand we need um, as we've really invested in that, that large scale infrastructure. So we need to be connected in with those, um, with, with our export networks. And you know that Australia produces far more food than we actually consume, something like 70% of our agricultural um, commodities produced are exported. Um, and then when we look at some of those overseas jurisdictions, I'll take Singapore as an example. Um, Singapore only produces 10% of the food that they, um, that they require. So they have a current story around uh, the 30 by 30 story, which is where they want to produce 30% of their food by 2030. Now, in order to go from 10% to 30%, there's a huge investment that they're making, um, both at the public and private levels, into the research that's needed to be able to um, deliver on that objective. And so with that level of investment, they're obviously able to scale and accelerate some of their research activities. So we do have, um, I guess, some competition in that space. But what we do there is we look to partner with them to understand what they're scaling, um, what their competitive advantages are, um, what our competitive advantages are, understand the fact that we can actually grow these crops out in fields or we can um, we have the, the resources that can go into some of these systems and look at some of the things like waste um, that we produce in our agricultural systems and see what the opportunities are there. And then we partner with the research institutes and, um, and companies in places like Singapore so that we can both together work towards these solutions because this is a global problem we're facing. Um, this is not their planet and our planet. It's, you know, you know, it's, it's really one planet. And so we have to come up with solutions that will work um, across all jurisdictions. Uh, I love that, Michelle. Uh, we are one planet and there are a lot of big problems that we are up against. But David, I know you're uh, headquartered uh, both in Melbourne and in the States. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I was going to say I've got a lot of uh, input to this particular <laughs> point because obviously starting a startup in this space, we started R&D here in Australia with all of the intentions to build a business uh, out of Australia. But really, we had to question um, the strategic importance of having a presence in an ecosystem like the San Francisco Bay Area um, for biotech specifically for a number of reasons. And I think, you know, population coming back to Michelle's point, that's one consideration in terms of, you know, how do you justify the millions and hundreds, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars that we'll have to raise to scale this at large enough volumes and then having a revenue model that's just supplying Australia, right? Like it just doesn't, the economics just don't stack up, number one. Number two, there was a sort of the reality of the infrastructure, food grade, large scale commercial infrastructure that we'll need to tap into. It is early as 18 months, right? So it's like soon. And I know that we're in discussions with, you know, the Queensland government, they're looking at setting up a biohub in Mackay, fantastic, right? We want to be here to support that. We want to be a company as soon as it's available. But really we sort of looked at, 
and dissected, you know, well, Australia's fantastic at R&D and innovation. Let's leverage that. That's a key strength of ours for getting to market with a product. We've got a very commercial approach. And so let's leverage that. And so we're continuing to do R&D in Australia and we will continue to, to do that because it is also very expensive to do R&D in the Bay Area. And we've got fantastic talent. We've got brilliant resources. We've got you know smaller facilities that can cater for great innovation in R&D. But at the same time, we wanted to try and tap into the infrastructure and resources that come from the US in terms of market size, infrastructure to scale, and of course, capital required to do this. And it's just a very unique ecosystem in and around Berkeley. Um, around talent acquisition, you know, um, and and just supporting other companies as well, like Culture Biosciences. They've got, I think, 80 something fermenters right now. So we can, we can quickly iterate and do optimization work. So trying to build a company in a way that makes sense um, to sort of take the best of both. And of course, when there is commercial production capacity in Australia, we want to be first and be absolutely there to also support that sort of translation of product and, and build an ecosystem here in Australia as well. Oh, wow. And Gordon, you probably have some thoughts on this as well, because I know, you know, you're working, uh, we were an investor in Bolt Threads. Uh, is there, maybe talk a bit about your experience with that. And also, is there something that we can be doing better here in Australia to support biotech startups? I know that's probably a big question. I think it's a huge topic. I'm not trying to evade the question. They're like, you know, Mars and Pluto, two, two different places. I think I like Michelle saying earlier, look at, start thinking strategically about Australia. Um, I do a lot of work in agriculture because it's food and energy and also biomaterials needs feedstock. It needs the sugar for driving the fermentation process with the microbes to produce whatever we need. So Australia's got a lot of potential for agricultural um, feedstocks to lift you know, a lot of production in that area. Um, we've got a very ancient, you know, thinking again strategically for Australia, we've got a very ancient land system, you know, the plate tectonic theories that we were all taught um, you know, the, the, the unique flora and fauna, the soil systems we have, there's some great opportunities in the 21st century to say, well, and it's going to cost a lot of capital, but there's going to be some unique molecules and, you know, um, you know potential products in the agri ag agricultural space for crops to come up with new, new um, you know, worldwide products. Um, so there are a whole lot of things we can think about in Australia that are unique. Um, but the size issue and, and the current rate of um, development in this whole life sciences um, early stage area is, is, you know, different trajectories. But we can still compete, so we've got to think smart about it. Um, and, and just one positive thing about that, the world is getting a smaller place. We've seen a big merger of the ag majors in the last th three to four years. Bayer buying Monsanto, uh, the Chinese moving in, Sinochem and Syngenta and Chem China, um, and then the Americans, Dow, DuPont, merging, demerging into those companies. The amount of um, interest capital flows into life sciences from early stage and, you know, the alternative protein game. There's a lot of um, head banging going on, a lot of people moving around, um, you know, via Zoom at the moment, but hopefully by transport. The world's getting smaller. And so I think the, the capital and the talent and will flow to regions where a lot can be done quickly. Um, and Australia's got some great opportunities in that regard. Back to Bolt, um, uh, that whole Bay Area that David's involved in, I went over there 10, 12 years ago from Sydney to work uh, on a fledgling company called Next Step that was building with Total, big oil and gas company out of Paris, uh, France and DuPont then to build a feedstock to lift the whole bioeconomy around the world, biofuels, biopower, biochemicals. And through that uh, 10 year period, I got to make other investments over there at the board level and um, could see what David's talking about and, and others about how it works and the opportunities there. I just think that I'll finish off with probably talking too much, but the multinational setup in America lends the idea factory to implementation and the capital around it to move much more quickly. And uh, you can get, is set up, set ups done quickly. You can start building scale um, in whatever you're doing with the right engineering people, which Bolt's doing has been doing quickly. Um, so they're different different setups, but you know I think Australia's turn's coming, but it'll be nuanced around strategy and also for supplying the Asia Pacific market for a lot of product. So our time's coming. 
Well, uh, you mentioned um, Talon. One of the questions we did have come through earlier was uh, what areas are most in need of talent? In uh, They say in the cultivated meat industry, but I kind of just want to broaden that to uh, agri-food biotech industry. Um, you know, David, maybe we can start with you. Uh, and then Phil, I mean, I know you have, you studied biotech, you started in the medical field. What are kind of some of the, how can we get more people into agri-food and biotech? Sure, I mean, there's just talent needed on the whole value chain, right? <laughs> so when you think about like cultivated meats, for example, then it's more around tissue engineering, you know, in terms of a hard science point of view, it, it's more around sort of uh, tissue regeneration um, and, and so forth and cell engineering. Um, when you come into biotech, I mean, obviously fermentation, you know, um, biotechnology um, support is, is hugely viable, but then of course, food science, you know, food chemists, um, how do we bring these compounds and integrate them into existing structures? The reality is that it, it, at least while you're at a small scale, it's going to be a very expensive product initially, right? And so the commercial reality of this technology is that they might be great in achieving something at a very small volume, but when you want to start thinking about mass market appeal, you've got to be inventive in terms of how do you integrate these to uh, existing things. So really creative food scientists, food innovation, those type of things, there's a huge need, I think, for that. And you know, of course, then you start branching into materials and all these other areas as well. So it's, it really is a plethora of, of skill sets required uh, from the technology front. Yeah, I completely agree. I kind of feel like ag biotech has taken second place behind medical biotech for way too long. Um, that's coming from somebody who's worked in medical <laughs> biotech. And, uh, you know, there's such great promise in, in the sector. Um, you know, but it, it really is still in its infancy. Although it's 10,000 years old, it's, it's still in its infancy and it's, it's moving really, really fast. So, you know, we need talent right across the board, as David said. Uh, many challenges are still in the lab, all the way through to market acceptance. Even things like logistics, how do you move this material around? There's just so much space for innovation. Well, we've just had a question come through around what are some uh, what are some key food consumption trends in countries like China, India, and other emerging markets? I feel like Michelle, you can probably speak to this. Um, yeah, look, happy to. Um, and I'd look, there's uh, they're different across the different jurisdictions, but certainly, um, you know, I, I might start here in Australia and say, you know, what we know is that we've got um, changing dietary patterns around many reasons that David I think spoke to in his introduction. Um, around concerns for animal welfare and, um, you know, the uh, concerns for the environment, planetary health and so forth, but also drivers around health and nutrition. So some of those um, are, are also um, key issues in some of these jurisdictions like China and India and other markets. But um, health is really the number one um, target in, in some of those markets. So, you know, I talked about that example of omega-3 before, where we need to get those micronutrients into those um, areas but we still see now in um, so China and um, India increasing amounts of red meat intake in those countries because they actually were um, disproportionately low compared to the global average whereas Australia and the US um, and some other countries are some of the highest um, consumers of red meat and so we're actually seeing shifts in dietary patterns in probably an inverse relationship there but there's also this focus on health. And so, um, and then there are, there are also some, um, in, I guess, schemes and um, government initiatives around um, balancing um, that the changing dietary patterns we're seeing over there with um, concerns about how we can produce, um, produce enough protein, um, in particular, that's my area of interest, um, for those markets in a sustainable way. So there's, it's, it's really those lenses of health and sustainability. And we are, we're also at the same time, because we have this massive growth in those, you know, we're going to have half of the world's population will be sitting in, in those regions. Um, that means that we, we just need more food in general. So we need more calories across the board. And so, um, so yeah, so there's, there is an increasing proportion of people who are trying these new plant-based and alternative proteins. Um, and we, we would also know that, um, in fact, in those markets, um, things like insect consumption is something that's already practiced. You know, there's 2 billion people around the world who are eating insects, whereas we're only just starting to think about it now um, and think about how we can use insects and other um, critters like that to convert really efficiently waste sources into wealth you know, so I think that's um, a really interesting take that they've got some traditions that we could learn from and vice versa. 
The other, the other thing I'd add to that, if I, if I could jump in, is like it, fermentation is a perfect example. Right? I mean, they've been fermenting tofu and all these things for so long, and uh, it's just part of their culture. So there's a cultural acceptance more so of being fermented products, number one. The other thing I'd add is, you know, COVID, once again, genotic disease and food safety. It's a major driver for the Asian markets. And when you think of the three key drivers that, um, um, that um, it, I guess, that consumers in the West um, buy from, it's, it's really price, taste and convenience slash accessibility. Whereas in Asia, it's, it's price, taste and food safety. So they value food safety, I guess, um, very highly. And I think once again, you know, with the sort of cleaner technologies, less fecal contamination or sort of cross-contamination issues, there's a huge opportunity for, for these type of foods as well, which is very appealing to, to that sort of Asian consumer and, and uh, sort of food safety games as well. And how do you communicate that? Um, I know Australia has, you know, just off the bat, a great and, and fantastic uh, reputation, but, you know, uh, you're implementing all these um, amazing technologies and, and and basically improving the foods we eat and improving their safety. How do we communicate that to consumers? So I might jump in on that because there's also another question around, you know, how biotech can improve um, produce tracing the supply chain. And that sort of mm -hmm. ties into that question of, you know, food safety, but also provenance because provenance is a, is a key area of interest. And, um, so, so I think there's there's a piece of work, another mission that sits within CSIRO called Trusted Agri-Food Exports, and that's really building on brand Australia. So it's thinking about how do we um, how do we communicate the fact that these were produced in Australia under these um, sustainable practices, and then um, are shipped into those markets and are un undergo all the stringent controls that we have in our agricultural systems. And so that piece of work is is about um, building the digital and data tools to, to automate compliance and show to those markets that these products were produced in, uh, in a way that um, is acceptable for their um, jurisdictional requirements, but also for consumer acceptance. And what we're now seeing is, you know, people aren't just going, turning a packet over and saying, okay, yeah, it's made in Australia. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, one of the, one of my bugbears at the moment is I walk into a supermarket and I pick up a, a product of protein in the supermarket. I turn it around and it says made in Australia from hundred percent imported ingredients. And I'm like, <laughs> that we've got to change that we've got so many ingredients here in australia that we can value add to um that we you know we shouldn't be importing these intermediary goods um but that's a slightly off topic but there are some great biotechnology tools that we can um, implement here from um, some of the tools around provenance being able to tell you know the isotopes of, of where something comes from um, and being able to track that all the way through and then combining that with the digital and data tools that allow you not only to look at that packet and read a label but scan it with a qr code or some other technology that tells you that it came from this region at this time and it's it's really that consumers wanting to know about that that product and where it came from and um and how they can support their local regions oh yeah well i mean look there's a, a lot of opportunities is what i'm getting from everyone <laughs> so we've had a question come through around uh, ag food regulation and how tough it is so for someone who's maybe watching who's not from the agri-food industry and who doesn't work in biotech or in life sciences. I mean, Philip, you would know in the med tech industry, it's obviously very highly <laughs> regulated. Um, in the food industry, what are some of the regulatory challenges? Just to give people a true appreciation for how hard everyone is working behind the scenes. Yeah, um, I guess for me, you know, regulation really has a, a big role. It's really, really important to Australia as we've talked about, we trade on our uh, reputation for quality produce. And, you know, that's in part due to the regulation. Um, that Those regulations need to have a scientific foundation um, so as to, to not block innovation. We haven't butted up against regulatory issues in, 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 just as yet, but we've taken a, a strategy to try and work within the boundaries of current regulation until until we have, again, that, that war chest and that, that time um, and resources to be able to, I guess, push those regulations a little bit. Right now, we're not using any GM products in our process. Um, but that's not to say that we don't see that the potential of GM to really accelerate and, uh, you know, take out our, our solutions to the next level. It's, it's very much front of mind. Um, 
but uh, I think there's always going to be that friction. That friction is good. Uh, the key is accessible information, transparency, investment, and getting that research to, to understand what the, the risks and the, and, the, and the pros are. But, you know, as I say, trust is hard to gain and, and very quick to lose. Thanks, Bill. Um, we've had a, a question come through. <laughs> Do agri-food startups get their fair share of investments? What's the uh, investment appetite around uh, agri-food startups? Maybe, Gordon, you can touch on this being an investor and also working in food and ag. Yeah, well, the, um, depending on which reports you, you read, looking back, dated 2020, the, the year we've just been through on venture capital investments, um, it's been a, you know, a major pickup from 2019. And then you go by category, um, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of investment in, in agri-food, in particularly around alternative proteins and the, the food side. And so that's definitely showing up in the data and, of course, in the media and, and everywhere. But it's, it, there's good reasons. I mean, it's a very powerful trend, the plant food um, you know, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, I think David touched on that along with Michelle. I mean, the data coming out there is um, the market surveys and just the cultural history, plus, you know, the, uh, the big drivers about we've got to produce more food quickly and, you know, and, and you put it all together and it's just a massive trend and the money's following. Um, and then also you're seeing a lot of merger and acquisition work. I mean, my old company DuPont, the um, post Dow DuPont merger, um, the DuPont um, nutrition and in, in industrial bioscience um, business has just uh, merged uh, New York Stock Exchange in recent months with IWF, IWF from Europe. And one of the major drivers for that was to actually go after Asia and start lifting, you know, plant food, um, you know, the, all the proteins required in food production right through the whole, you know, menu of opportunities. Um, they want to be there as a one-stop shop to help, you know, grow that market. And the numbers are extraordinary. So I don't know whether that answers your question t totally, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really hot area and for good reason. You know, it's, it's front and central. Um, the other issue I spent a lot of time, well, as I said, I go, going down the, the, the textiles route on the biomaterials side, and, but, and I've been watching this since 2014, working back in the States with Kleiner Perkins on um, Beyond Meat. I was working on um, uh, a vegetable seed aggregation play called Volo Agri back in 2014. At that stage, 2013 actually was, um, I was shown that prospectus when, while I was working there and I thought, you know, that sounds like a great idea, but I was too busy involved in other uh, activities. We should put a few dollars into that at that point. But um, that was only six, seven years ago and look what's happened, it exploded. So um, the, the real issue I'm looking at now is, you know, 50% of our calorific intake globally is wheat, corn and rice. Mm. So I'm spending a lot of time uh, investing in ways, technologies that can boost that or safeguard those production units for the global food system. And invested five years ago in a company called Power Pollen, which is very interesting out of Iowa. For those that are, don't know the US so well, it's corn, that's zip, ground zero for corn. Um, and what we've been doing is uh, working on a system to technology to collect, um, interestingly, preserve and spray pollen on corn hybrids. Uh, all the genetic work that's been going on boosting, you know, seed, uh, hybrid seed in corn to lift yield year and year, year after year. There's been no work for about 60, 70 years after we figured out what the crossings are to go away in isolated blocks and cross pollinate, which is so inefficient. You know, the male and female lines may not sink in the same way, wind, other issues, um, drought, heat, you know, and it, it, after all that heavy work and heavy lifting, you know, when you actually go and produce the bags of seed for the 93 million acres of corn across America for ethanol and food production, um, you know, that system is not, not working. Well, they said, you know, you can never preserve pollen, it's too biologically fragile, well, watch this space, we're right onto it now. <laughs> They're the kind of things that are really, you know, strategic from an investment level are important. Um, on the, you know, what could really make a big difference quickly. I think innovation, you know, breakthroughs, we need to, like the alternative food protein space, we need to lift food production. Everybody knows that they're powerful drivers. The, the, the key is to actually direct capital. Things are gonna make it a difference more quickly, globally. 
And that also, by definition, means actually coming up with new innovation in business models. So not just, this is the fascinating part, not just the underlying technology. It's like, how can we also design new business models to go with the big majors to, to get the technology out there quickly and distribute around the world to make a real difference? There's a lot of stuff going on. But, um, I can see everyone nodding <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> Does anyone we're, else? All, we're all we're all working hard on it, but it's uh, you know it's the time. It, the, actually, the key is the time. The clock is ticking. You know, back ten years ago, we had a soft commodity price um, squeeze, and we'd actually seen corn. I think corn bushels, US dollars per corn bushel this morning, five fifty five at the close, Chicago. Anyway, ten years ago, we're up six, seven, eight dollars a bushel. It doesn't take much, you know, in the food systems around the world to go awry yeah. on top of you know just pestilence and whatever. So it's a big, it's a big deal, and time is ticking. So, so I might just jump in on that. Um, the business model ones are a really interesting point, and it's something that we at Zara are now doing very differently. You know, um, I guess uh, traditionally scientists develop these great ideas. They get them to a point where they think, "Oh, someone will invest in this now. Well, let's let's take it out to market. Let's push that science out." Um, now what we're trying to do is um, have a look at the, the opportunities in the market, um, see what, where the market pull is, and then match that market pull with our science push and actually start to come together earlier on to co-create some of those solutions that address both the great science ideas, especially that we have in Australia, um, but also with those market opportunities. And so um, I guess V2 Food was one of the examples of that, um, where we brought together the great um, science that existed within Syro. We brought together, you know, a company who had all the distribution channels, who had the willingness to embark on this and wanted to have a solution um, in market. And so that was, you know, the work of um, Competitive Food Australia, most, most commonly known as Hungry Jacks. Um, but then bringing in the investment um, and, and also putting in place an entrepreneur who really knew how to drive a business and, and um, get that off the road. So that's you know, a new way of working for us. And now we're seeing the benefit of that model um, with launching new companies into market that can address a lot of these big challenges we have in the agri-food space. Yeah, look, I think that's uh, I think that's really exciting. We're we're excited about that model too here at Cicada. Uh, look, we're we're running low on time, so I want to finish off with one question, which also came through uh, in the live Q and A. But I was going to ask you guys myself anyway. Um, and just to wrap up, what what is the one thing that you're uh, the breakthrough that you're most excited about uh, in this industry? Uh, you know, it could be happening now, it could be happening in 10 years. What what gets you out of bed in the morning? Uh, and maybe we'll start with Phil and then David. Yeah, certainly for me, again, a biased perspective. Um, you know, the, the circular economy, I guess that's become a bit of a buzzword, but really how do we make more out of what we've already got? It just makes sense. You know, if we do more with what we've got, there's more to share. We're a happier planet. Awesome. And yeah, from my point of view, I mean, to me, coming, I mean, it's different from, I guess, Gordon, you know, and, and Michelle, maybe you've been working in this for, for such a long time um, and have seen, I guess, the evolution. But for me, it just feels like maybe it's because of where the pricing is right now and this sort of now this transition into finished end food products. But it feels like we're just at the cusp of just a huge revolution in food. And in fact, that's why I settled on this particular technology, as opposed to cell-based meats or plant-based meats, which I was also, also assessing, because I can see that this additive manufacturing approach is just endless and will allow the customization ability, which will then be able to change and iterate with consumer trends over time, which I really love. It's not subtractive, it's additive. And so therefore it allows you full strength and possibilities to just endlessly push the boundaries. I mean, we've got to meet people with where they're at today to step them across and to switch. And there's already a huge challenge in that. So, but then really pushing the boundaries of where food can go is endless. When we start using microbes as, as engines um, and really harnessing that power, that's what I'm excited about. Because I think in dairy, I mean, starting with cow's milk, sure, that's what we're all used to, but it's not really made for the human body. You know, there's allergenicity issues. There's a whole bunch of other things that come along with it. 
where I can see the future, and I'm thinking five years ahead already, right, is for like, how do we engineer these things out using CRISPR technology, using different technologies to make them hypoallergenic or zero allergenicity? How do we look at carcinogenic effects or any other health issue effects? And how do we engineer them potentially out completely? And then not only that, but why, you know, there's, there's a whole new future of, you know, um, of different products that we haven't even tried and combinations that I think with this additive approach in biotech is just so exciting and just really, uh, it's, it's a new era in food as far as I can see. Yeah, the idea of being at the cusp of something and uh, being there at the very early stages and seeing it kind of blossom is very exciting. Uh, how about you, Gordon? And then maybe we'll finish with um, yeah, Michelle. I'll be real quick. Um... Uh, there's a couple, but I'll just mention one. Uh, back to the pollen, I think, you know, the issue around food is real and the time issue and the weather and, you know, climatic issues doesn't take much to really tighten up food supply. So power pollen has accelerated ag technologies in Iowa. We've been doing the impossible. I said, you know, heavyweight uh, senior people in the seed industry running the seed majors across the world said it couldn't be done. You know, but pollen is biologically too fragile to go out and harvest it, collect it and preserve it, you know, for say a year and then spray it, you know, for a whole host of good, you know, seed production and yield agronomic reasons. Um, well, we're just about to prove that it can be done. And the exciting thing, we teamed up with BASF recently to go after wheat and I'm excited about wheat it's never been properly hybridized and it's such a big issue for Australia is wheat. If we can start, you know, spraying um, using pollen, dropping into the precision ag and all the other digital technology, all the other plethora of technologies coming in and then be able to collect and preserve the right pollen from the right male varieties um, when we want to and spray them when we want to, to produce varieties, lots of new varieties at a local level to be able to tackle the climatic changes and even in season while you're growing the crops to change if the climatic um, uh, conditions change. That's all coming off this technology and it's getting very close to market. So um, that's the one that fascinates me because helps Australia, helps the world, 50% of our calorific in, in, uh, intake is on three of those crops and it can hybridise all three. Wow. Thanks Gordon. So from my perspective, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say from my perspective, I'm, I'm not going to end on a technical uh, technology <laughs> solution. I'm going to I'm going to say it's about harnessing the, the amazing ideas and, and the talent we have and bringing that together. So it's about how do we bring the research innovation ecosystem together with industry um, to form public private partnerships to form, to form partnerships across the value chain. Um, so that we have mutual benefit and we create as much value as we can. So we're creating jobs in regional Australia. We, you know, we're harnessing the, those great ideas that um, exist within um, our innovation ecosystem, but we're doing it for those benefits of sustainability and health. So to, for me, it's just that excitement of being able to bring that all together. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, we're also very excited about uh, you know, the future of food and, and we're very happy and excited to partner with anyone um, in this space. So uh, looking forward to talking to you all a lot more in the future. Uh, thank you for joining us today and thank you to everyone uh, that attended and thank you to our event sponsor, VOCAG. Um, now, before we sign off, uh, we're hosting Mentor Office Hours, also in partnership with the VOCAG as part of our grassroots series. Uh, if you want an opportunity to chat one-on-one -on -one with people like Gordon, who has deep industry expertise, and we also have investors, um, uh, other founders, please, uh, we'll follow up with a link and, and join in to uh, register for your one-on-one -on -one 30 minute session. Uh, thank you all so much for joining again today. Uh, have a great day and there'll be a recording of this show uh, online afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>